Hello, gardeners, and welcome to another edition of Your Gardening Week Live. This is the spot to come on Mondays to get your gardening week started and fill your heads with all kinds of wonderful gardening information. It's great to see everybody checking in. Let's go ahead and get to a question that MB Gardener asked right away this morning. Pulling tomatoes, noticed a scale-like insect, and wondering if it's okay to put into a cold compost pile. This is a really good question. This time of year, for most of us, it's fall. We're putting material into our compost piles. And you've heard all the time, don't put diseased materials in, don't put insect materials in, all that kind of stuff. Well, in hot piles, you can put just about anything in because the pile will reach the high enough temperatures to kill the pathogens, to kill the insects. But, and that's why this is a good question, in a cold pile, a pile that does not reach the high temperatures, you do have to be careful. Now, I've said before in live streams, it's helpful to understand the insect pests in your garden and understand their life cycles. Well, typically a scale and aphids, really small insects, you can put them into a compost pile, even a cold compost pile, and over the course of the winter, they're going to die. They don't have any of that fresh plant material to feed on, and they're going to starve to death if they don't freeze first. But do make a point to try to identify the insect for sure. There are some borers that will overwinter in the soil. There are others and many other insects that will overwinter in plant debris, all the old dried leaves and stems and branches. And so if you put those into a cold compost pile, you might be giving them the perfect place to overwinter because the pile is not going to be breaking down. It's not going to reach high temperatures and you might be actually encouraging some of those insects that will overwinter in garden debris. So find out what the insect is for sure, but the smaller insects like scale and aphids, yes, you can throw them into your compost, cold or hot, and it'll take care of it. Great to see everybody checking in today. Jean-Pierre from Belgium was one of the first checking in all over the country, all over the world. I just think this is so incredible. I say that every week, but it's so nice to see you all every morning. Paul Biggs is saying hello from Dallas. Kiri Nowak is checking in from Colorado Springs. I'm going to highlight Kiri Nowak because she's the one that does the work after this live stream is over. So I've said before, if you are watching on replay, on about Thursday, you'll see that there are timestamps for all of the topics that we talk about each week. If you're watching this live and you want to go back and catch up on something, you can go to those timestamps. Well, Kiri is the wonderful woman that helps me with that every week. She listens to this entire stream, takes notes, and then puts together all those timestamps. So I'm giving a shout out to Kiri. I hope you can show her a little gratitude and love in the chat right now because she's the one that helps make this such a useful stream for those who aren't able to join while it's happening live. So good to see you here today. Uh, Team Pumpkin says, hey, I'm going to make a tomato garden for money. I'm 12, so I don't know much. I've been researching and watch a lot of you. I'm going to do it all year round in a greenhouse, and in winter, I'll use heaters. That's often awesome, Team Pumpkin. I will encourage that you think about your lighting because a heated greenhouse is wonderful in the winter, but one of the things that really slows down the growth of plants during the winter time is the light. The plants, especially tomatoes, are still going to need at least six hours of full light. More is better. So in a greenhouse setting, in addition to the heaters, make sure you've got some light set up so that the plants will continue to grow and continue to fruit. Because if there's not enough light, they're not going to set the flowers and fruit. 
Tomatoes are great in a greenhouse setting because they self-pollinate. You don't have to worry about insects. So they'll do great in the winter as well. One of the little tips, I grew tomatoes in a greenhouse for years. Occasionally, as the flowers start setting, shake the plants a little bit. That'll help shake the pollen on those flowers so that they can pollinate themselves. So that's awesome. I hope you have great success. I hope you earn some good garden money by growing your tomatoes. That's really great. So Jake Dixon is saying uh, that he all, she also sees that Heidi Clark is a new moderator. Thanks for helping to support the Gardener Scott channel. So I want to point out that Jay Dixon and Heidi Clark, you see a little wrench next to their names. And I talked about this last week with Jay when she was first starting and now Heidi has been added. These are two of the expert gardeners who follow along on the chat every week. They have great information. If you ask a question and I don't get to it right away, one of them will probably pick up your question and give you an answer if they're uh, capable, if it's something they know and they know a lot. But I encourage all the rest of you to get involved as well. If you see a question or a comment and you know something about it, jump right in with it as well. So good to see you here, Heidi, and I appreciate your assistance. Karen Colson says, I just love the background in all caps. Well, that background is Linda Hardwick's garden and some of her produce. Look at those beautiful fruits that she's harvested. So thank you, Linda. I saw that you checked on pretty early today. Great to have you here. I hope you have a smile on your face from seeing your garden as my background and obviously it's something that a lot of others are liking as well wonderful harvest lots of green lots of uh, good in the background today so thank you linda and thank you karen for pointing that out and if you're new to this stream or you're just catching up and haven't seen it in a couple weeks this is something new that i'm doing if you have a picture of your garden or your harvest that you would like to share with me and I can put it as a backdrop on these Monday live streams, go ahead and send it to me. You can send it to Gardner Scott at GardnerScott.com. And I've got a few more lined up in the queue. So you'll be seeing other gardens in the weeks to come. And if you want yours, just go ahead and send it to Gardner Scott at GardnerScott.com and it's likely to be included. And if you include a story about your garden, or about your gardening, uh, I'll definitely talk about that as well. So good to see that we have this wonderful community and we can all share not only my information about gardening, but this is really cool because we can actually share your gardens as part of the community as well. That's just, just incredible. This is such a wonderful community. I wanna talk uh, as well about a question that Tennessee Mountain Morning had. What do you do if you have too much organic material in your beds? Do I need to add some native soil to balance? So I've been talking uh, and have a few videos recently and more to come about soil, adding organic material. That's the best thing you can do to improve your soil. But you can get to the point where you've got too much organic material in your soil. And that actually can be a bad thing because if you have a nutrient overload in your soil, there are some nutrients that the plants will suck up first. And if there's a whole bunch of those nutrients, it basically blocks a lot of the micronutrients from getting into the plant. And so plants can be stunted. They can not flower, not fruit, and actually look pretty bad if there is too much nutrition in the soil. And I know that sounds backwards, but that's what happens. So there is a point where you should stop adding organic material to your soil. Typically, as most of us are starting our gardens, it takes about three to five years of amendments every year to reach that point when you can slow down a little bit. And so at about the five year point, instead of amending every single year, start thinking about amending every other year. And at that five year point, 
it's also a good idea to send your soil into a lab for testing just to make sure that you're keeping up with the knowledge of your soil and you you may find out that you have an overload of certain nutrients well if you see this happening if you suddenly realize that you've got too much organic material in your bed and it's overflowing I would suggest go ahead and take out some of that organic material yes you can add some native soil to help balance it out to bring down the percentage percentage of that organic matter or just take some of that soil from that bed and put it into a grow bag or a five gallon bucket and start growing more plants in soil which is probably good because you've been amending it and now you can extend your garden space by growing in a container while you're focusing on the bed that maybe has too much organic material in it. So I'll be covering that much more in depth as as I start doing more and more of those soil videos. Um, but that's the basic idea. Sure. Add some some native soil to balance it out and take out some of that excess organic matter to grow other plants. OK, Chris Kennedy is saying, hey, from Ontario, Canada, I believe I read a few months back that leaves contain two, three times the amount of nutrients as cow manure. I thought I'd ask if you'd agree. Um, yes and no. It depends on the plants. So if you think about it, the, the cows and the horses, all the animals that are eating the leaves will digest it and they will absorb most of the nutrients in those leaves and so then when the manure comes out there is still the the nutrient rich manure but yes it's been depleted because a cow's four stomachs has sucked up some of that nutrients so while manure is great in the garden and it adds a lot of the organic matter back in it's not necessarily adding a lot of nutrients and so the fresh leaves do have more nutrients. Adding those leaves to your compost pile will put more nutrients into your compost than if you add the manure from the animals that ate those leaves. And that's one reason why you see a lot of teas, like fertilizer teas made from leaves. Now I have a video where I take comfrey leaves and make a fertilizer using the comfrey leaves it's because those leaves are packed with nutrients stinging nettle is another perfect plant where if you take the leaves of stinging nettle and make a tea it's packed with nutrients so yes you can expect that the nutrients in leaves will be more than manure but we're typically talking fresh leaves once the leaves have dried and uh, they're no longer fresh they will lose some of those nutrients so in that case a manure might have more of the benefits than dried leaves but the dried leaves will still have a lot of the minerals they'll still have some nutrients fresh leaves are really the way to go okay Rose is saying hi Gardner Scott do I need to turn or dig my soil for winter it depends I did a video recently about amending my raised beds I have a video that came out on Saturday where I talked about no dig gardening and I've got a video coming out on Thursday where I talk about no dig and no till and it really comes down to your methods of gardening and your soil so if you have good soil you may only need to add compost on top of it and not turn it at all that's the no dig method that Charles Dowding in England has written books about. If your soil isn't that great and still needs, needs some improvement, then you can add the same compost or other organic material and turn it in. That's more of a no-till method of gardening. Tilling is when, in my opinion, you take a mechanical device and blend all the ingredients into the soil. By just turning over the soil, that's closer to a no-till. You're incorporating the organic matter in. So it depends on your soil. If you're still improving the soil, like in that three to five year period, then yes, fall is a wonderful time to turn organic material into your soil. 
But if you've already got that point, like we were just talking about, where you've got too much organic matter in your soil, then you probably don't need to add compost at all. And you certainly don't need to turn it over. So uh, take a look at your soil, take a look at how you like to garden, and that should help out a little bit. Okay, also wanted to talk about Jeremy's nature book question, which was about coffee grounds. And I, I, I've answered a lot of questions about coffee grounds because this is just one of those things where the information that you hear may not make sense. So here's the thought. Coffee grounds are supposed to be great for your garden because they have nitrogen. When you can put them into the soil, they add a nitrogen component. But it doesn't make sense because the beans are dried and they're brown. And we're told that when we make compost that a brown is carbon rich, not nitrogen rich. Well, coffee grounds kind of breaks the pattern with this. Even though coffee grounds are brown and they are primarily carbon based, they do have nitrogen in them. So co coffee grounds are great for adding to your compost because they do give a small boost of nitrogen, not a lot. And it is an organic material for your compost pile. When you're talking about the, the nutrients that are in coffee, once you've used the coffee and it's the grounds as opposed to the fresh beans, then yes, by putting hot water in those coffee grounds, you are drinking a lot of those nutrients. You have leached out a lot of the material in the coffee grounds. So what's left is a very small nitrogen component. And the same with all of the other nutrients that might be in coffee. If you put fresh grounds in your garden, you will get more impact, but that's an expensive way to try to add nutrients and not necessary. A little bit of nitrogen with those used grounds, even though it's brown, and you'll do fine. Lori and Green, thank you so much for that super chat. First year ever amending my garden for fall. Can't wait to see how it performs next year. Thanks for all the knowledge. Learning makes gardening fun. Well, I'm so glad to help you out. I totally agree. I, I like gardening because I learn so much about gardening and I'm always discovering something new. So uh, I totally agree with you. I The learning is as much of um, why I garden than the harvest that I get because there's a lot of times I don't have a harvest but even when I don't have a harvest I continue to learn and that helps me enjoy and Carla nice to see you again on Monday thank you for the collab vid with Tony good info uh, so I hope um, most of you have seen that video that came out last Friday where I partnered with Tony O'Neill from the Simplify Gardening Channel and we had a really nice chat about crop rotation in the garden and whether it's necessary. And neither of us think it's needed. There are a few instances where crop rotation in the garden can help. But check out that video because it was a lot of fun making. We're already talking about the one that we'll be doing together in the spring. So you have something to look forward to. Okay, Team Pumpkin, good to see you again. Glad to see you've got such a great interest at a young age. Uh, should I use dirt from like the ground or buy special soil for the tomatoes? Um, it, again, it depends, but chances are the soil from your ground is not going to be as rich and have the nutrients that your tomatoes will need. So kind of like what we've been talking about already with amending. For tomatoes, they're going to need a lot of different nutrients. So you need a soil that has a lot of different nutrients. And the way to do that is to add a lot of different organic materials. Compost is usually made up of a lot of different organic materials. And so that's why, like with the no-dig method, you just put compost on. The assumption being that that compost has varied materials in it, lots of different nutrients, and you can get away with just compost. But whether it's compost or leaves or grass, or kitchen scraps. You should be adding something else to your soil when you want to have success rather than just dig up what you might be walking on. Okay, 
<coughs> Max Hilaria says, Gardner Scott, I've become really interested in Korean natural farming. Do you have any thoughts or opinions on it as I start my research? So Korean natural farming is becoming much more popular. It tends to be practiced more in very warm areas, tropical, subtropical regions. That's where it's gaining a lot of uh, attention and being used a lot. It's just being discovered, I think, in areas like the UK and the United States. It has some really great ideas. So the one idea is the IMO, indigenous microorganisms. And I love that idea. And if you've seen my videos and if you've listened to these chats, you know that I think the organisms in the soil can make all the difference in your garden. So Korean natural farming really focuses on trying to develop a natural native environment to encourage those microorganisms in your soil. And with the growth of those microorganisms in your soil, your plants and your garden will do better. I do have some issues with that and other methods of gardening that require you to, I'll say, make concoctions. So one of the things that Korean natural farming does is you take organic materials and you blend them with other materials and you encourage bacterial growth and then you take that concoction and you pour it on your soil or you pour it around your plants. That can give a boost to your soil, but I'm a relatively lazy gardener. I like to just go out and build an environment that is natural. And I honestly don't like spending a lot of time creating fermented mixes. And especially with the Korean natural farming, you start with rice and you have to add all these other ingredients, which typically you have to buy from people that are trying to sell you the idea of Korean natural farming. And whenever somebody comes to me with a great idea of how to improve gardening, but you have to pay for it to get the secrets, I question that a little bit. And so that's my concern about Korean natural farming is it's being touted as a wonder and a great way to get great plants, but you really have to follow some step-by-step -step directions with rice and with these other materials that you have to buy to create these concoctions to add to your soil. And in some way, I think that's artificial. If you just put organic material in your soil, your native bacteria will find it and your native soil microorganisms will be there. And so what you're doing is you're growing a soil environment that is suitable for your garden. You're not necessarily in, in you don't need to buy or bring in bacteria or any other organisms. And even if you do, especially like in my environment with very cold winters, very hot summers, very dry conditions, if I incorporate anything that's not native to my environment, there's no guarantee that it's going to live. So I can do all these things to improve my soil. This is why I don't encourage that you buy earthworms or you buy mycelia and bring it into your garden because it's not native and it might not live in your garden. I think it's so much better to just build your soil with organic material that's natural to you and let your own natural environment grow without too much extra work. So I am planning a video on Korean natural farming while I'll, where I'll repeat some of this and I'll also go much more into depth with some of those practices. If it works for you, if you like it, if it's something that you want to try, by all means, do it. Uh, it's just not something that I think I'm going to be trying other than just as an experiment. Okay, Riverdale, and I saw earlier that River and Dale have a holiday today, so, so glad that you have a holiday. Riverdale Garden says, Gardner Scott, putting my garlic in this week, 
gets me thinking about next season love your video on this subject as well thank you so much i have a few videos but yeah recently i did the start to finish on garlic so if you haven't put your garlic in yet and you're wondering about it i have a video an older video on how to plant garlic and then i have a more recent video on how to do the whole process and there were some questions earlier as well about garlic and squirrels and moles and voles and gophers generally speaking those type of digging animals are not going to eat your garlic but those are burrowing animals and if they happen to be burrowing in or near your garlic bed they might not eat your garlic but they can definitely disturb it they might dig it up they might taste it just to see if it's something edible and so garlic is often used as a deterrent for voles and it's often used as a deterrent for gophers but just like any other animal if they're hungry enough there's a chance that they could be eating your garlic uh, just think about that all plants kind of fall into that category deer perfect example one reason why there's no deer proof garden is because deer if they're hungry enough will eat anything and there's a lot of burrowing animals that will do the same thing especially the young animals they don't know yet that they don't like garlic sure they don't like the smell but they're digging there they're going to take a bite just to see if they like it or not so generally speaking your garlic is safe from burrowing animals just don't be surprised if it happens and you lose a few okay let's see what else we have so glad to see thank you john ann answering team pumpkins question uh, it's so nice to see everybody helping out especially a new young gardener like that and tammy thank you for responding to team pumpkin that's just incredible i just love it so much okay i wanted to talk a little bit this week about biochar i've been getting some more questions about that especially as i talk about amending the soil biochar is one of those amendments to consider now biochar is more than just charcoal from a fire and i talk about this in my video about using biochar in the garden it has through a process called pyrolysis the volatile oils aren't there a lot of the gases that might be present in charcoal aren't there and it's a great repository for soil back Bacteria. and therefore it's a great soil amendment because it's almost pure carbon it doesn't decompose once you add biochar to your soil it will be there for centuries long after your gardening there will still be biochar in your soil if you amend with biochar and all of the millions of micro pockets of space within the biochar is where bacteria will live and where nutrients were, will accumulate. And so when you have biochar in your soil, it's kind of like adding uh, a safety deposit box of good things in your soil. When the soil gets depleted, the biochar will release those nutrients. It's like going to the bank and taking out some of the good stuff that you stuck away. That's one of the ways that biochar works. So when you amend your soil, again typically in the fall is what i recommend and you're adding the compost and you're adding the leaves and you're adding the grass and you're doing all the rest of that if you have biochar go ahead and add biochar as well and one of the great things about biochar is you only need to do this once because it doesn't decompose because it doesn't break down you amend with biochar for the first time and it becomes the last time you need to do it so check out the video about biochar think about it as one of those amendments i've had a lot of questions lately as i'm showing me amending the beds and i'm not adding biochar well that's because when i first filled the bed i put biochar in and by filling the bed with biochar in the soil in the beginning you never have to worry about it again so that's why i'm not adding biochar in these newer videos because it's already in the soil it's a one-time deal and that's all you need to worry about okay 
Let's see, Team Pumpkin has another quick question. How do I water my tomatoes? Should I just mist each time? Um, with all plants, and in a greenhouse, you have to be a little more careful because the heat and the humidity throws things off a little bit. Be careful about getting into a pattern of always watering every day at nine o'clock for five minutes or whatever you you think might be a good schedule. Check the soil. Actually put your finger into the soil to see the moisture level. And with all plants, especially tomatoes, you want a consistently moist soil. So water as need, as often as you need to, to keep a moist soil. You may find that it does work out to a fairly regular schedule, but the only way to do that is to physically check your soil. Dig up a little bit, hold it in your hand, squeeze it. You shouldn't be able to squeeze out drops of water. It should just feel moist like a wrung out sponge. And when you can consistently reach that level in your soil, then you're watering enough. Crystal Gale is saying, Gardener Scott, my pepper plant suffered from verticillium wilt. What's the best thing I could do to amend the soil to help this issue? Should I use vermiculite, organic matter, and compost? Um, this is one of those issues. Um, the, the wilt is going to be all around us. It, it tends to hit tomatoes hardest. It can hit peppers. It's going to be in your soil. As far as amending to help with the issue, just keep amending the soil like you always would. But you can expect that it's going to remain in your soil for a number of years, at probably at least three years. So this is one of those instances where if you know you have verticillium wilt in your soil, use a mulch that can help reduce it uh, being uh, sent up to the stem and the leaves and rain and while you water, but you probably might want to consider some crop rotation and growing peppers and tomatoes in a different bed for a period of years while it dies in the soil. Um, but continue to amend the soil, continue to improve it, continue to grow other plants in it, and also consider looking for varieties. There are a lot of varieties of plants out there that will be resistant to diseases like that. And so if you grow a plant that's resistant to a disease and you know you have that particular disease in your soil, you can probably get away with growing those kind of plants. But in this case, this is one of those that just happens to gardens. And once it's there, it tends to stay there by creating a healthy soil with all the organic matter and good draining soil. Uh, you don't necessarily have to add perlite or vermiculite. I think organic material is usually enough. Um, you'll be able to continue gardening without too much concern. But if you do see infected plants start to develop, pull the infected plants before they add more of the disease back into the soil. Okay. Lots of activity. Oh, Heidi Clark is talking to Simplify Gardening. I didn't see Tony check in, but I'm guessing that it's there. Talking about drip irrigation. And Senna Saint is saying, drip seems like a lot of materials outlay to me. I prefer heavy mulching and hose watering if and when needed. And Senna, that's the way I like to garden as well. Now I've used drip irrigation in the past. In the beds where you have permanent plants or you have plants that are going to be there for a long time, drip irrigation can save a lot of energy. It does involve some outlay in the beginning to get all the materials. For me personally, I love getting out in my garden. I love that interface with the plants on a daily basis. I really like it. Getting out in the morning, you know, the birds are chir chirping, the butterflies are flying around, the bees are buzzing, the sun is coming up, and it's time to water the garden. I like hand watering because not only can I determine, like we talked about, whether the plant even needs water based on the soil moisture content, but I can look at the plant and see if it has verticillium wilt, or see if it has early blight, or see if it's being infected by aphids. Drip irrigation, in my opinion, can take away some of that observation from gardeners. It becomes really easy to just turn on the timer, 
and the plants get watered. And that's fine in perennial beds, in beds where you're not as concerned about those insect pests. But in the vegetable garden, I really like to hand water. And another issue that I have with drip irrigation is you set it up for your plants. Well, that's great, as long as those are the only plants you're going to be growing in that bed that season. Well, because I do a lot of succession planting where once the beets are done, I pull them up and then I'll put in cucumbers. Well, now the emitters are set up for the beets and I have to redo the system for the cucumbers. And again, I don't like to work that hard that often. So when I do use drip irrigation, what I'll do is I'll have a cucumber set up. And so I'll have the, the main tube and I'll have the emitters that branch off of that, all sized for a particular bed for cucumbers. And then when I pull the cucumbers out and grow something else, I'll take that whole drip system and put it in the shed and use it again next year for the cucumbers that I grow in that same pattern. Otherwise, you have to just keep redoing it, punching holes, plugging the holes. It's a great system. It's not one that I necessarily use. So it's interesting to see some of the conversation going back and forth. I just really like hand watering and the drip takes that away. Amy Soden says, what do you do for watering when you leave town? I ask my family or hire a neighborhood kid to water my garden. Uh, now, like most gardeners, I think I don't leave town during the height of the season because I'm concerned that it's not going to be done right. But there's almost always somebody that you can find to water your garden. I have set my garden up with an automatic timer in the past when I was traveling with my family. And you can come back and you can expect the weeds to be growing and you can expect not all the plants got all the water they needed. That's why I like to hire a neighborhood kid to come in. And you have to work with whoever it happens to be. Show them how to do it. Let them do it while you're observing. And I, I've had great success with that in the past. Um, the other option is just to leave and come back to dead plants, which is not something I think any of us really want to do. But seek help. Find someone else that can water your garden. And, and again, this is part of my philosophy, getting other people interested. If you can find someone like a 12-year-old who wants to grow tomatoes in a greenhouse, they would probably love to come to your garden and water and see all the plants that you're growing. So seek out the, the youth, teach them a little bit, and you may find that you have a new friend in the gardener world that will do watering for you. Linda, thank you so much for that. I love reading and learning from your live chats. Well, I appreciate that, and I appreciate the background today. That's wonderful. Let's see what else we have. Jeremy's Nature Book says 271 watching, 81 thumbs up. Shows some love. Thanks. I appreciate that. By all means, if you're benefiting from this at all in the live stream, give me a thumbs up. If you're benefiting in the replay, you can give a thumbs up as well. I appreciate that. Laura Full says container gardens aren't vacation friendly at all. Definitely. And I will give a caveat to my drip irrigation. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of setup. You got to buy the materials. But I have done drip irrigation on a timer for some of my container plants in the past. And that it's because container gardening in summer in particular, the containers will dry out more quickly than the beds. They usually need to be watered every day, if not more than that. And so uh, because you hire the, the kid in the neighborhood, it always seems like they forget some of the containers. I have in the past set up drip irrigation for containers just to try to ensure that they will survive if I have to leave for a period of time. Yes, you are exactly right. They don't do well when you're not there to baby them and that can be a concern. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Bob Campbell says, our community garden is invaded by squirrels. Am I fighting a losing battle trying to keep them out? Yes, I think you're fighting a losing battle. I talked about this last week a little bit. If, if there are squirrels in your area, there are squirrels in your area. And if you're trying to keep squirrels out by whatever method, 
there will be other squirrels to move in and take the place of any squirrels that vacated because of your action. And what I recommended last week was if you've got a squirrel problem and you can't get rid of the squirrels, then learn to live with the squirrels. And that might mean setting up a squirrel feeder where they're spending all their time at the squirrel feeder or bird feeders because they'll eat the same seed that the birds eat. <clears throat> and then you can save your garden from that. But yes, often when it comes to squirrels, it's a losing battle. Now, some animals like gophers and rabbits and deer, you might be able to win that battle, but I don't know anyone that's ever successfully fought the squirrels and won because there's just another family of squirrels down the block looking for a place to spread out, and that might be the empty space that you've created in your garden. Bonnie Moore, thank you so much for that super chat. I really appreciate that. Sherry Robinson says, how can I compost indoors? So composting, and, and I've got a video on understanding compost where I talk about the different types of bacteria and how those bacteria will break down the material. There are, are a lot of considerations when you make compost. To get really quick compost, you need a hot pile, and to get a hot pile, you need a lot of volume, and there's no way to get that volume inside your house. And so traditional composting methods inside really don't work well because you need just too much volume, and you really need a lot more bacterial action than you can get inside. It's a cold pile and the volume is just not gonna be enough to break down very quickly. But look at Bokashi. Bokashi is a fermenting process. So when we compost outside in a pile, we're using aerobic bacteria to break down the organic material. But you can compost indoors using anaerobic bacteria and the Bokashi method. And the end result is essentially the same, where you've got the organic material that's been broken down, decomposed, and you can use it in your garden. So as far as indoor composting, check out Bokashi, B-O-K-A-S-H-I, and that may give you some ideas of how you can compost inside. I do not have a video on that yet, though I am planning to do one probably over the winter. So check that out. Chris Kennedy says, I sick my dog on the chipmunks. She doesn't hurt them, but runs them off. Yes, chipmunk squirrels, cats, dogs, that's definitely one way to try to keep them under control. And Lily was great at chasing the squirrels when she saw the squirrels. But as soon as the dog or the cat comes inside, um, the squirrels are back. So it, that I will say, yes, dogs can help keep the squirrels under control. It won't eliminate the squirrels, but dogs and cats in your yard can definitely help from um, or help with that problem where the squirrels are less likely to come to your garden if they don't know if that dog is going to appear. So there's a lot of hesitancy, which is why they'll often go to the bird feeder to get the food rather than deal with the dog. Okay. I also wanted to talk this week about winter as those of us in the northern hemisphere are starting to move into that direction. Some of you are probably getting really close to your first frost date or maybe you've already passed your first frost date. So now it's time to start thinking about winter. And I want to start with winter composting since we've already talked a bit about that already. <clears throat> you can compost in the winter. Now, Here's the caveat, you need a hot pile. So if you've got a good mix of the greens and the browns and the nitrogen and the carbon and you're turning your pile and you're keeping it moist and you have a pile that's running in excess of 140 degrees Fahrenheit, um, we're talking like 60 degrees Celsius. If you've got a pile that's running that hot, then you can compost all winter long because your pile's staying hot and it's fighting off the winter. It takes a lot of work to do that. There will be kind of a, a balance. It, it really works uh, pretty amazing how the outer layers of your compost pile become 
kind of like an insulation. And so you've got the cold air on the outside and the hot air on the inside. And compost can actually really decompose well in the winter. Throw a tarp over it or a space blanket or some other material to keep it warm and help keep the cold out. And you can keep composting. Most of us that are practicing cold composting, which means we throw stuff on the pile when we have it, we turn it when we think about it, we try to keep it moist. It takes a lot longer to decompose, but eventually we get compost. Well, in those cold piles, the winter comes, there's not going to be enough heat that's generated to keep the pile hot and it's going to cool down and the bacteria is going to stop the decomposition and for many of us with really cold winters the pile is going to freeze in that case just accept it every year my compost pile freezes solid and i have to wait until spring when it thaws out and then the bacteria kick right back into action once it gets warm again and the pile will start decomposing I'll throw stuff on my pile, even when it's covered with snow, I'll still throw the, the stuff that I'm cleaning up from the garden on my compost pile. It will not decompose over the winter, but when the spring hits, the bacteria will be ready to go. They'll be ready to eat all that fresh food. And that's kind of the way that I approach cold composting. So think about this. If you're really interested in composting, you're doing a lot of composting right now, the winter will affect it, and it's your choice whether you really go into the hot composting or just accept that a cold compost is going to stop. The bacteria will go dormant. There will be no more decomposing, and you just have to wait until winter's over. <clears throat> okay, and then I also wanted to talk about just winter gardening in general because it can be an option. Now, I've talked recently to um, some of you who have asked questions that live in like Southern California or you're in Louisiana or Florida, and you can actually have a real garden in the winter. Uh, like the Mrs. Marvel in Arizona, this is the time of year where gardening actually starts kicking into high gear because you don't have the high temperatures of summer anymore. So if you live in an environment with a warm winter, I encourage that you really start looking into growing during the winter if you haven't before. A lot of first time growers think they can only garden in the summer. And then once the summer's done and they fought the battles with the sun and the heat and the pests, you forget about winter. I encourage you move into winter gardening. Winter gardening typically has fewer pests because the cooler conditions just means those pests are bur burrowing into the ground or going dormant or dying on their own. With the sun decrease in winter, the plants aren't going to grow as quickly. You'll see a noticeable slowdown in the plants. You might not have the flowering and the fruiting during the December and January height of winter, but the plants will still be alive. Then once the light kicks back in with the sun, once things start growing again, everything will start growing. And so when I was growing in a greenhouse, I would actually start sowing my cool season plants like the beets and the spinach in early winter in the greenhouse. It would take a long time to germinate. Once they germinated, they wouldn't grow very much. But as soon as the sun started picking up in February, those plants would just take off and they were protected from the severe cold in the greenhouse. Those are some of the considerations. <clears throat> if you can have that as an option, growing in a sheltered area like a greenhouse or some hoops or cold frame, you might be able to get some stuff growing in the winter. I do have some videos that are coming to talk more about that, but I want you starting to think about it right now. If it interests you at all, start doing a little research, start doing a little reading, and start paying attention to what you need to do to actually grow some stuff in the winter. You might need to be very selective in your choice of plants, especially if you're in a cold region like mine. 
You can't grow tomatoes outside in the winter. You might not be able to grow tomatoes in a greenhouse unless you have, have that extra light and that extra heat. But you can grow some plants that can really handle the cold, like spinach. I've, I've grown spinach outside in January because it can really hold up to the cold. Kale, there's a lot of varieties of kale that can handle the cold. So think about it, look into the varieties, look at what you might be able to do, and it might give you a little bit longer season and definitely improve your knowledge base. Nadine Horton is saying, Garner Scott, I'm in Connecticut zone 7A. I've switched from grow mode to build and design mode. Build a four foot tall elevated raised bed for next garden season. My back will be happy. <coughs> that's great. And that's typically the mode I get into this time of year as I start building the garden for next year. Great idea. Do the work now while the warm temperatures are still around. It's not too cold. Get your beds built. Get your soil amended. Get the structures in place. Mulch the soil or put in a cover crop over the winter. And then just sit back and learn about the things like winter gardening. You might not do it this year, but you can learn about it this year. And then when the spring pops up, you're all ready to go. Your beds are built. Your soil's ready. And then you can put the seeds and the plants in. So good for you, Nadine. That's a great idea, something I encourage everybody to do. Shorty8256 says, Gardner Scott, is there any nutrients or minerals or things besides browns and greens that I need to add into my raised beds this winter for spring 2021 gardening? Absolutely ties in with the, the same thing we're talking about. So the nutrients, the greens, the browns, the compost, yes, add all of that to your soil. Biochar, like I talked about before, if, it, if it's something that interests you and you think it could help your poor soil condition, <clears throat> add biochar. Now, there isn't a caveat about biochar. Biochar is great for poor soil. It's great for building soil and improving soil. But once the soil is nutrient rich, it already has all those nutrients in it, biochar loses some of its magic. So if you've already got good soil, then you may not need to add biochar. But all of that organic material, add it to your beds now. Yes, it's a great idea. The one thing to add that maybe you haven't thought about, I just kind of touched on a little bit, is an organic mulch on top and or a cover crop on top. That would be the thing I would suggest making sure you you consider moving into the winter. So many gardeners spend a lot of time amending the soil in fall and then they leave everything uncovered. And you have the potential for erosion. You have the potential for sun damage where the sun's radiation will kill some of the soil microorganisms. And it's much better to just cover the soil going into the winter. You're not going to have any weeds germinating or at least fewer weeds germinating in the spring because those weed seeds aren't going to have the sunlight to help germinate them if you've got a mulch in place. Because the very first plants that grow in spring are going to be the weeds. So the one thing to add to that mix, you've got the right idea. Just make sure you're putting something on top of the soil to put your beds to rest for the rest of the winter. Okay. Uh, Indiana Backyard Gardener says, add organic matter. That's the most important thing you can do for your garden. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for helping me reiterate that point. Organics, organics, organics. And just keep adding it until you get to that point where you're happy. you got a really nice, good, rich soil. Linda saying, after you inoculate the biochar with soil and compost, how much water do you add, i.e., what is the consistency supposed to be like, oatmeal or peanut butter? So biochar comes bone dry and and inoculating it and again check out that video so you understand the concept where we're adding the liquid we're adding some nutrients we're adding those microorganisms like the bacteria to the biochar we before we typically put it into our soil and so it's typically kind of chunky it's kind of like oatmeal and uh, that shows you that the biochar has completely absorbed the material. And then you spread it throughout your soil and you incorporate it into the soil along with the rest of the organic material. 
Now, if you're filling a bed for the first time, it's okay to use dry biochar. And I've done this before just to save time if I'm filling a lot of brand new beds. In the fall, you're adding all this organic material, you're putting all the biochar in, and over the course of time, the months between the fall and spring planting, the biochar will absorb the moisture, the microorganisms will find their way into those micro crevices, and the soil will inoculate the biochar with the life that is already in that soil. But if you're doing it all ahead of time, then yes, you want something that's a little bit chunky and think of it as kind of a, a, an oatmeal that you've got in a bowl and the oatmeal has already soaked up all of the water. That's kind of what you're looking for in the biochar. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up. So good to see both Jay and Heidi helping out. I appreciate that so much. It's so wonderful. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see. I want to go ahead and talk about one more thing. I see a lot of conversation going back and forth. If you have a question, do put the at symbol and Gardner Scott, and that way it'll show up on my screen so that I can see it's a question. If you don't put that, then I'm assuming that it's more likely conversation going back and forth and it's not as easy for me to see. So like Jeff Davis is asking a question and it was kind of hidden in my mix. So if you put Ask Gardner Scott, it's more likely to see it. And Jeff says, here's an easy tomato question. Is it okay to mix tomato varieties in the same small bed? Wasn't sure if it makes it easier to pass viruses, etc. cetera. Um, that is kind of an easy tomato question. And yes, it's okay to mix tomato varieties in the same bed probably not going to have a big problem with them passing diseases back and forth if one, you grow from seed and grow your own tomatoes, and two, you buy from a reputable nursery. Most likely you're not bringing in diseases if you grow yourself or get it from a nursery that you know is clean from diseases. And it gets back to the variety that I talked about earlier. There are some tomato varieties that are resistant to tomato diseases. So if you're growing two different tomatoes side by side and one is resistant and a disease does find that bed, well, it might infect one tomato and not infect the other tomato. But other than the disease concern, just save space in your garden. And if you're growing tomatoes, grow multiple tomatoes in a particular bed. They have the same water needs. They have the same water, um, sun needs. They have the same nutrient needs. And so you might as well grow multiple tomatoes because if you're taking care of one tomato plant, then you're taking care of all the tomato plants. I wouldn't be so concerned about the disease if you're practicing good organic gardening methods where you're keeping the soil happy, you're bringing the nice insects in, you're giving them the sun and the water and the nutrients they need. Disease is less likely to find your garden. There is that possibility. If you have a terrible infestation and the diseased plant does get brought in, it could infect the plants nearby and is likely to infect the plants nearby. Less likely to infect plants that are growing in another bed. But like Tony and I were talking about in our video about crop rotation, if you've got a disease in one bed, you've probably got that disease in a lot of the beds nearby. So that's just part of gardening. Try to avoid it from the very beginning and then you don't have those issues. Tamara Benet is saying, I had some potatoes popping up out of the soil with some green on them and then just covered them up. Once a potato gets green with the solanine go away with, or uh, will the solanine go away with covering it up? Um, I'm not positive about that. That's one of those things if you have potatoes like in your pantry and they're exposed to sun, they'll turn green and that green can be toxic. It's not going to kill you, but it can cause some issues. If you have the tubers that are popping up through the soil, um, go ahead and cover them up. Put some soil on top of them. When you harvest, you'll probably see that the problem is corrected because as they grow, that green should go away. But if it happens right as you're ready to harvest and those potatoes have been sitting out in the sun, 
you might have an issue. Those might be the potatoes that you feed to your worms in your worm bin. Um, probably best to avoid them just so nobody gets nauseous or has any issues with eating those tomato or potatoes. But covering up should definitely help. Oh, I need to go back. I just missed a comment. Okay, I appreciate the names coming up. Now I'm seeing a lot of things coming. A lot of good questions. I appreciate that. Simplified gardening. There's Tony says, right, Scott and folks, I have to shoot. I got to take kids to their karate lessons. Catch you all soon. Great live again, mate. Well, thank you, Tony. I appreciate you in there saying that. Say hi to the kids. Go get those karate lessons done. And for those of you that haven't discovered the Simplified Gardening channel, check it out. Tony is wonderful. Lots of great information, especially about potatoes. If you want to know about potatoes and growing potatoes, check out Tony and Simplified Gardening. Okay. Let's see what else. Myra Sharp is saying, sorry, joining later. First time growing bitter melon. Do you or anyone here know how you know how you know when it is time to harvest bitter melon? Um, that's a good question. I've actually been reading up on bitter melon, um, but I don't know exactly. Uh, so some of you that are growing in the regions of bitter melon, by all means, please share with Myra. I think it's typical, like most melons, where you'll start seeing the, the melon where it connects to the main vine will start to turn brown. That's usually an indication for most melon species that they're getting close to harvest. Uh, but I don't have a lot of experience with bitter melons. So hopefully there's someone out there that can share with Myra and give some good information. And Sina Saint says, green potatoes are great for seed potatoes. Good Good suggestion. Yeah, if you've got a green potato that you're worried about eating, it's still a viable potato. It still has the eyes on it. It will still grow into a plant. So if you can grow multiple crops of potatoes in your growing season, that's a great use for the green potatoes. Thanks for suggesting that. I like that idea. <clears throat> Riverdale Garden says, River and I may be making hot sauce with some super hot peppers we grew, habanero and death spirals course I'll be the one tasting have you ever made your own hot sauce um, I actually um, wanted to make a video about this this year where I was gonna make hot sauce using my peppers and then the freeze came and killed all the peppers um, fermented I'm not sure if you're doing fermented or vinegar I've made my own hot sauce using vinegar before and what I wanted to do this year was make hot sauce using a fermentation method so both great ways to do it, completely different flavors. I'm not sure which one you're doing, but it can be a great way to use your peppers to pulverize them in a food, a food processor and either ferment them or add vinegar and salt and whatever else you want to add. Great way to use your peppers and create your own hot sauce. So um, have fun with that. That can be a good project. Okay, Team Pumpkin, good to see you here today. I hope you learned a lot. You say you have to go look at greenhouse and heaters. And if you join the stream again, that's great. But you can also see it in replay. And good luck with your tomato exercise in your greenhouse. I'm so glad that you were here today. <coughs> okay, Carla says, um, Mark, it's self-sufficient me replants green potatoes so that they don't go to waste. There you go. Um, and the self-sufficient me channel and Mark, a lot of great information there. Okay, and BD is saying bitter melon question. I grow bitter melon, but there are so many types which results in different sizes. It's hard to directly answer that question. Yeah, so look for look for the 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 stem starting to brown and maturing, and when it dries, then the melon will definitely be ready to harvest. Uh, you can also do test harvest. This holds true not only with bitter melons but all melons. If I'm growing uh, watermelons, for instance, I can grow some smaller melons and they're getting close. I'll harvest one, cut it open, see how it looks, see how it tastes. And if it's right and ripe, then I'll harvest the others. If it's not quite ripe, then I'll wait for the others. So hopefully you have some that you can sacrifice and get to that point where you can harvest one as the test case to determine how the others do. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Um, 
Jeff Davis says, I tried five large buckets of potatoes this year and had good success with them all. Harvested about five to seven pounds per container. Didn't have many problems with them. That's great. Um, I'll be doing a lot more uh, potato growing next year. I'll be doing some more videos. Tony has really got me motivated. I've done a little bit of potato growing in the past, um, but seeing the success that you've had, Jeff, and that Tony had on Simplify Gardening, um, potatoes are just a, sa a great crop to grow. And I used to think, and I still do to a certain degree, but I used to think potatoes are so inexpensive. You can find potatoes on sale at the grocery store in big bags, and you think, why should I go to all that effort to buy or to grow potatoes? They take up a lot of space when I can just spend a couple dollars and buy a bag in the store that gives me all I need for a long period of time. Well, the thing to think about with potatoes and all crops is the potatoes you can grow in your garden will taste completely different than the potatoes that you buy in the store. It's like that garlic video that I did a few weeks ago where we tasted the garlic I was growing and it tasted nothing like the garlic that we buy from the store. Potatoes are the same way. So as you think about next year's gardening, and if you're not growing potatoes, think about growing some potatoes in containers. It's a great way to do it. And pick some varieties that might give you some really good flavor. <clears throat> okay, let's see what else we have popping up. I'm Mark Wise says, how long temperature wise into the fall do you usually think you can take sugar snap peas reliably? reliably? I have some growing now, but I'm not sure I'm going to get a good harvest. Um, you can take them pretty far into the fall. The, the issue that you have is that they can handle the cold. The sugar snap peas can handle snow without too much problem. It's just as the weather gets to the point where it's too cold, like I was talking earlier about winter gardening, the plants are going to slow down their growth. And so the peas, the pods that are developing will not develop as quickly as they do in the spring when the temperatures are increasing. So you can probably take them definitely past your, your first frost date, past your first freeze date, but there will be a point when they slow down. The wonderful thing about peas is the pod is edible and delicious at any size. So you may be trying to grow bigger pods. You may not be able to get big pods as we move into the colder weather. Just be ready to harvest early, especially when you have a really hard freeze coming. Go ahead and harvest all the young pods. They'll still taste delicious, and they probably wouldn't mature much past a hard freeze date anyway. <clears throat> okay, Ray55Root says... Your video with Tony was very informative and interesting. Thank you. I'm glad you appreciated that. We had a lot of fun making it. And like I said earlier in the live stream, we're planning on doing another collaboration video this spring. It will be unlike anything you've ever seen before. We're trying to really push the, the boundaries with some of these collab videos. Lena Abbey says, homegrown potatoes are the bee's knees, buttery texture, and just mouth-watering. Yes, thank you for substantiating that. <clears throat> it is. It's one of those things. You can grow red potatoes and purple potatoes and blue potatoes. They all have different textures. They all have different tastes. Um, and it really is one of those ways to expand your gardening world and grow things that you hadn't even thought about growing before. And um, I, I like to grow... Um, parsnips and I like to grow turnips and one of the reasons for that is particularly the parsnips I like to mix them with my potatoes either roasted so when I roast I'll put beets and parsnips and turnips and potatoes and roast them all together it's just incredible to have a roasted root vegetable side dish but I'll um, boil up some parsnips just like I would potatoes and I'll make mashed potatoes with parsnips and so when you use one of these unique potatoes with a root vegetable like parsnips oh, it's a whole new taste sensation so start thinking about those kind of things as you're picking up out your crops for next year 
John Ann Johnson says, look at Gardner Scott's how-to videos for how to transplant tomato seedlings. Um, oh, thanks. I'm guessing you're answering a question about that. Um, yes, I got uh, some good videos, some older videos on tomatoes and transplanting and all that kind of stuff. And I know those of you that are watching from the other side of the world, to me, as you're getting into your spring, I've got a great library of seed starting, transplanting, growing tomatoes, all those kind of things. So I do encourage and thank you, Janan, for pointing that out. And I've got a lot of information. I do a lot of talking about moving into the winter because um, that's what I'm doing and that's what most of us are doing. But for those of you that are starting your spring, <clears throat> all these things that I'm saying to think about for next year, well, you're already there. So I hope you're starting to practice some of this stuff as you're getting your gardens started in the springtime with the forecast growth and great harvest that you're expecting. And I hope it does all turn out. <clears throat> okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Tamara says, for that roasted root dish, I reduce some balsamic vinegar and drizzle on top. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a delicious way to do it. I usually um, will add my herbs. And so recently did that video where I dried herbs. And so I'll do my root vegetables with some of my dried thyme and salt and pepper, and it's as simple as that. And I'll drizzle olive oil on it, <clears throat> but I love balsamic vinegar. I use that a lot when I, uh, when I cook. So great idea, Tamara. Thanks for sharing that. That just makes my mouth water, especially since I've got some root vegetables in the ground. I may just have to cook something up like that for dinner here soon. That's a great idea. Okay. Um, Kimye is saying, first year I planted rainbow carrots. Can't wait to see if they taste like an orange carrot. Um, I haven't grown the rainbow carrots. I have grown the purple carrots. The flavor is very, very similar, um, but slightly different. I'm guessing the rainbow carrots, you'll probably notice a slight difference. I think the yellow isn't as carrot tasting, um, but that's wonderful. Good for you. Let us know in the months ahead how that turns out. Frank is saying soil is everything when it comes to potatoes. Absolutely. And that, that can really make the difference between successful potatoes and not is your soil and the nutrients. Um, because for those tubers to fully develop, they need not only a loose soil where they can grow, but they need all the nutrients in the soil. So you're absolutely right, Frank. Levita Clark says, please assist me in the right direction for the best seed buying. Do I have a seed catalog? I do not have a seed catalog. I do have a couple videos from this last year where I talk about seed buying. I talk about the seeds I bought. I do give some recommendations. So look for some of those videos about seeds and the buying that I've done in the past. Um, I, I have one of my favorite seed companies. And so some of my favorites are Territorial Seeds, uh, I love Seed Savers Exchange. There's uh, ev almost everybody's favorite is Baker Creek. There's a lot of really good seed companies out there. But check out my video because I cover a whole bunch of different companies. And I give a little bit of um, my own analysis of which ones I think are good, not so much. MI Gardener is a very popular one. Um, someone earlier was talking about getting potatoes from MI Gardener. Cheap, cheap seeds, inexpensive seeds, I should say, and they grow great. I will be doing a video here in another couple of months once I start getting my seed catalogs, and I'll talk about seed companies again and the seed catalogs I prefer, but lots of good ones out there. Okay, um, Le Heidi saying, Levita, no, Gardner Scott does not. Oh, thank you. You're just answering the same question I did. Thanks, Heidi, for jumping in there. Um, <clears throat> Let's see what else we have popping up. Jeff Davis is talking to, I'm Mark Wise, saying I started my fall crop of peas the beginning of September. Snap are the one of the varieties, and they are coming up good so far. If frost holds off a few more weeks, I might be okay. Um, one of the things I hope to show in a video um, soon is putting a cover over the, the beds, and I'm planning to do a double cover and then I'll be growing things like spinach and peas in that double cover and hopefully growing well into November and December. So I'm going to be testing this myself. But for both of you, Jeff and Mark, um, 
put hoops over your beds, cover with plastic, cover with tarps when the cold comes, and you should definitely be able to extend your pea season longer into the cold days that are coming. Laurelful says Praxis seeds are good. Yes, that's another company, Praxis. There's, um, he's got a, a gardening channel as well, and he sells seeds that are inexpensive as well. And I haven't actually bought any of the Praxis seeds, um, but I'm guessing they are the same source as MI Gardener. So you can probably expect that they'll do fine. All of the MI Gardener seeds that I grew this year germinated and did just fine. Senna Saint says, Gardner Scott, I'm going to go get some lunch now. Great stream and looking forward to coming back next week. Have a great day. You as well. And you can always catch up on the replay for the philosophy that's coming up here in just a couple minutes. Good to see you. Thanks for checking in and checking out. It's Jennifer Segrist is saying, my beans are showing an iron deficiency. Can I use the ironite we have that is made for lawns? Um, yes, you can. And actually, I do that. That's one great way to get iron in your soil. If you buy um, a, a iron supplement that is specifically made for vegetables, it comes in small containers and you're going to pay a lot. You can buy a big bag of a nitrogen fertilizer with iron in it that's made for lawns pretty cheaply. And that's typically what I do when I am amending my beds, if I know I've got an iron deficiency, almost always we've got nitrogen deficiencies. That's what I use is lawn fertilizer. That's got the nitrogen in it and it's got the iron in it. And it works just fine for me at a fraction of the cost of buying an iron specific amendment. Barb says, Gardner Scott, is it okay to plant elderberry cuttings at this time of year? I'm in Midwest Michigan. Um, Maybe. The thing about elderberry cuttings, it's all about the roots. And so if you've already started the cuttings and they have good root development, you can put them in the ground now and depends on when the freeze comes, they might be able to root in the soil. They might be able to make it through the winter. Uh, what I'm doing for my cuttings that I've taken recently, not elderberries, but some other plants, is I'm growing them inside through the winter. I've got them in pots under lights and I'm just gonna let them root and develop a good root system over the course of the winter and then I'll transplant them in the spring when I know they'll survive because they've got the root development and the soil will be warming in the spring. The issue you have, especially in Michigan, who knows what's gonna happen with our weather. And so if you put cuttings in now, and we have an early Arctic blast that comes up here in the next couple of weeks, those cuttings probably aren't going to survive. Depending on how many you have, you can try putting some in the ground, but I would also suggest just keeping the others protected indoors and then put them out in the spring. That's the way I do it. Brian is asking, Garner Scott, can I interplant my English peas with my crimson clover to get a food crop and a cover crop all at once? Sure, absolutely. Um, that's a really good way of taking the advantages of both. Now, um, both of those plants are, are legumes and can put nitrogen in the soil. So you're going to be harvesting the peas. I talked about this in my myth video recently. Once you let the peas grow and then harvest them, those plants are going to use up pretty much the nitrogen that has been gathered from the air in the, new in the root nodules. But the clover as a cover crop is great to add nitrogen to the soil. As long as you don't let it flower and as long as you turn the green clover back into the soil, that's a great way to do it, great way to get the nitrogen in and a great way to, to use that space growing two plants at the same time. So great idea. I think it's something that I will encourage you to do. Okay, <clears throat> Indiana Backyard Gardener is saying, Gardener Scott, will my greenhouse be enough protection for my raspberry, blueberry, and blackberry in pots? Probably. Depends on how cold your uh, greenhouse gets. The red, all of those berries can handle winter conditions without too much trouble. I overwinter my raspberries and blackberries 
in 5b where it gets down below zero Fahrenheit at least once if not multiple times during the winter and they come back they're in the ground they can handle frozen soil the biggest issue with a greenhouse and overwintering berry plants like that is trying to avoid the pot the problem if the soil dries out and desiccates the roots and as i talked earlier about container gardening um, that's the issue when you have plants in containers is the soil is more likely to dry out as far as the temperature don't worry about the temperature at all the plants should be able to to handle whatever conditions come even freezing conditions in a greenhouse just try to make sure that the soil doesn't dry out because when they're outside they're getting snow the soil is at least getting some moisture and the roots can handle it not so in the greenhouse okay Lena Abbey says, I saw an interesting video of someone using adult multivitamins crushed and dissolved in water to amend soil for deck secondary macronutrients. Is there any truth to this? Um, well, the macronutrients are the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and there aren't a lot of that, or isn't a lot of that in multivitamins. Get a lot of the other micronutrients, copper, iron, molybdenum, you know, those kind of things. There aren't a lot of those type of nutrients that are in adult multivitamins. Um, you know, the B12, those type of things that we take for our bodies, they're really not going to help the plants out. So I've seen stuff like that before. There's a few issues. One being the nutrients are made for our bodies, not for the plant bodies. They're not in a form that is easily accessible by the plants. And it's kind of an expensive way to try to get nutrients to your plants because multivitamins aren't cheap. And when you grind them up and add them to water, you're diluting the nutrients that are there. And then if you add it to the soil, even if some of those nutrients are suitable for plants, that's just not there in a big enough amount to really make that big of a difference. So if you know your soil is deficient, in some of those nutrients that might be in a multivitamin, it's more efficient to just amend with that specific nutrient as a fertilizer. Much better to just have a balanced soil with organic matter. So no, I don't think multivitamins is really a good way to try to improve your plant growth. It's, it's not going to have much of an impact at all. Okay, and this does kind of lead us into the point of philosophy that I want to talk about today, and it's about learning. And of course, I touch on this every week. I'm trying to make you all better gardeners, and the way to do that is by learning as much as you can about gardening. Now, I did not start gardening knowing a fraction of what I know now. What I know now has come from experience, it's come from experimentation, and it's come from a lot of learning. Learning from my own successes and my own failures, but also just reading books and reading blogs and watching videos. And that's what I really want to encourage you to do. Because as we're putting our gardens to rest for the winter, or as we're starting our gardens growing in spring, this is a really important time to really boost your knowledge base. And one of the ways to do this, and what I want to really focus on this week, is learning about the different methods of gardening. Yes, you can learn about planting a seed, and you can learn about fertilizers, and you can learn about watering. Those are really broad-based areas. But when it really comes down to how you garden, it really helps to understand different ways of gardening. So I talked earlier about Korean natural farming. That's one method of gardening. And in many ways, it's more a philosophy of gardening because you have to go through all of these different steps to get your soil ready and to grow your plants. Well, what do you know about biodynamic gardening? Biodynamic gardening shares a lot with Korean natural farming. 
they both involve making up those mixes. They both involve improving the soil. They both have similar philosophies when it comes to how you approach gardening and the efforts you're going to take. You could be a biodynamic gardener. You can be a Korean natural farmer certified. I encourage you learn about both of those methods as you're thinking about how you're going to garden. The video I had come out on Saturday was about no dig gardening. I had a lot of people commenting about how I could do this and how I could do that. And I have I thought about this other thing. Well, without exception, all of those suggestions were actually more appropriate to no till gardening. And so the video I've got coming out on Thursday actually discusses that no dig gardening and no till gardening are two different ways of gardening. They both have the same goal when it comes to improving the soil. They have very similar methods, but they're two different ways of gardening. And that's what I'm talking about today is understanding the fine points, the specifics of these different ways of gardening so that when I talk about no dig, but you're thinking no till, well, we have a disconnect there. But if you understand the difference between no dig and no till, I can talk about one and you fully understand what I'm talking about. Or you have a discussion with another gardener about no till gardening and you're both on the same level, understanding the same themes, the same words, the same methods. Uh, I also, you know, bring in the concept of Ruth Stout. Well, Ruth Stout is a method of gardening where you're using hay as a mulch to improve your soil and then planting in that. Very similar to black, back to Eden gardening. Back to Eden gardening, instead of using hay, uses wood chips to improve the soil. And then you plant in that. Well, if you can understand the similarities and the differences between the Ruth Stout method of gardening and the Back to Eden method of gardening, it makes you a better gardener. Because now you can understand why they both work for different people or why they don't work for some gardeners. Ruth Stout actually does better in my region than Back to Eden, but that's because of my environment, my dry weather. And the Ruth Stout hay breaks down faster to improve the soil than to Back to Eden wood chips. But if I lived in the Pacific Northwest, like all the videos that you see with the creator of this Back to Eden method, where it's always wet, and the wood chips break down very quickly, it makes more sense why that method works because the hay breaks down too fast. You need something like the wood chips. And that's what I'm encouraging that you do. When you hear a new term when we're talking about gardening or you hear someone talk about how they garden and it's a method that you're not familiar with, well then learn about that method. When you hear people say they're organic, gardeners will learn what that really means because you can be an excellent gardener and have great success using non-organic methods. Doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. Doesn't necessarily mean you're doing anything right. It just means you're doing it differently than someone who's practicing organic methods. But it helps to understand the differences and the similarities. And so when I approach gardening, because I have researched and I understand these different methods, I can choose what works best for me. So I use a little bit of Ruth Stout. I use a little bit of Back to Eden. I use a little bit of Korean natural farming. I use a little bit of biodynamics. I use a little bit of organic gardening. I use a little bit of non-organic gardening. I use a little bit of no dig. I use a little bit of no till. That way I can garden for me in my garden with my climate. And that's why I'm suggesting you start 
expanding your understanding of gardening and you really seek out this time winter is perfect where we're not in the garden so all the time you were spending out in the garden well now spend that time watching a video or reading a blog or reading a book so you begin to understand some of these other philosophies some of these other methods and you may find a better way for you and even if you're practicing one of these methods if you are a back to Eden advocate and that's the way you garden well more power to you that's wonderful but start expanding your world start seeing what else is out there besides back to Eden because you may find that some of those additives that are used in Korean natural farming might help you out in your back to Eden garden because the wood chips maybe aren't breaking down as quickly as they should but if you incorporate some of that bacteria concoction to advance the decomposition of your wood chips your soil will improve faster there's so many different combinations that we can use with these different methods and I'm not saying one is better than the other and I'm not saying one is worse than the other I'm just trying to advocate that I can choose from many different methods to really figure out what's best for me. And so as the video that just came out talks, I don't practice no dig gardening because no dig gardening, as written about by Charles Dowding, is all about compost. And it's adding compost to the top of the soil and letting nature do all the work. Well, my soil isn't at that point yet where I can get away with just adding compost to the top. I don't have the development of the soil organisms yet to just add compost to the top. But by practicing some no-till methods where I incorporate the material into my soil to become nice and rich and packed with nutrients, in a few years, I can practice no dig gardening where all I do is just throw compost on the top of my beds every year and walk away and the soil will maintain its nutrient rich condition. And so that's what I'm talking about is don't be so focused on one way as the right way. Focus instead on doing it in such a way that you don't have to worry about any particular methods. So think about that from this point forward, especially as we move forward and you have more time on your hands. You have the ability to become a better gardener with more knowledge and more improvement in the way that you garden. And so I hope that's one of those things that you can really take to heart. I'm going to be trying to do more and more videos where I'm comparing different ways of gardening so that you can see some of the similarities, you can see some of those differences, and I'll do my part to help. But it really does come down to you and your own growth when it comes to educating yourself as a gardener. And now is the perfect time to do it. If you're moving into winter, you've got the time. If you're in your spring and starting your garden, again, it's a perfect time because as you move into the growing season, understanding these different ways of doing it, maybe trying something new this year, could make all the difference in your garden. So there you have my soapbox chant for the week. I hope you learn more. I hope you get that education really jump started so that you become a better gardener and you figure out the right way for you. Because the right way for me in my garden is not going to match the right way for you in your garden. But we can both have some similarities even amongst the differences and have that garden success. So that's what it's all about. It's the gardening success, the enjoyment along the way. And as we started off talking about what makes us happy in the gardening and that learning makes us happy, well, learning definitely makes me happy in the garden. So 
We're about at the time where we have to call it a close. Chris, thank you so much. Always a joy to have you here as well. River and Dell, I hope you have a wonderful week. Magdalena, thanks for the thumbs up. Tamara, Malat, Jennifer, Della, Heidi, Guanto, Barb, Tammy, Janan, Levita, Linda. It's always so nice. It is a fast 90 minutes, and I look forward to the next 90 minutes that will pop up next Monday. Amy, M88, Russell, great to see you here. I hope to see you all next week. And as always, I'm Gardner Scott. Enjoy gardening.